This is a University of Otago podcast. Hi there, uh, my name's Colin Gavigan. I'm the, the director for the Centre uh, for Law and Policy and Emerging Technologies here in the Law Faculty. I'm going to be your uh, chair tonight for this discussion of WikiLeaks. Now, WikiLeaks, as you may know, was launched in December 2006, originally as an uncensorable system for untraceable mass document leaking. Its early revelations were ostensibly directed towards, they said, exposing oppressive regimes in Asia, the former Soviet bloc, sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East. Its early revelations uh, included details of alleged extrajudicial killings by the police uh, in Kenya, of tax avoidance by Barclays Bank, and most entertainingly, I think, of Sarah Palin's email account. Um, WikiLeaks made global headlines, though, just almost a year ago, uh, with the publication of the infamous collateral murder video. Uh, this showed US Apache helicopters fire on a group of civilians, or several groups of civilians in Baghdad, two of whom, it later transpired, were Reuters journalists. In October last year, WikiLeaks began releasing the Iraqi war logs. These were classified US Army field reports from the Iraq war, um, which among other things led to a re-evaluation of the numbers of civilian casualties in that conflict. And shortly thereafter, they began the incremental release of some quarter of a million leaked State Department cables. Uh, a release described by Dan Gilmer on Salon.com as a pivotal moment in the future of journalism. Uh, subsequent attempts to curtail WikiLeaks activities, the backlash from WikiLeaks supporters, and particularly the, the, the now famous cyber collective known only as Anonymous, and the recent attempts to extradite its founder, Julian Assange, have, if anything, come close to eclipsing uh, the content of the leaks themselves. And I've seen such terms as hacktivism, and DDoS enter the popular lexicon. Assange himself has risen from relative obscurity, at least out with the, the hacker and uh, activist community, to being named Time Magazine's Reader's Choice for Person of the Year in 2010. Uh, if you're interested, he finished ahead of the Turkish Prime Minister Ersep Erdogan and Lady Gaga. Um, a quick search on Google tonight before I come up here revealed some 22 million hits for Julian Assange. Um, Jonathan Pilger has said of the State Department leaks that of all the spectacular revolts across the world, the most exciting is the insurrection of knowledge sparked by WikiLeaks. And that was in the context of discussing some of the revolts in North Africa and across the Arab world, so quite a claim. And Time Magazine has claimed that the WikiLeaks revelations could change history. A somewhat darker spin on the same claim uh, was made by Guardian writer Michael White, who described Assange as potentially the Gavrilo Princip of the Third World War in the context of a discussion about China's relations with uh, and views of North Korea. Now, joining us tonight to discuss or to help navigate a way through this vexed legal and social and, I guess, moral labyrinth, we have two esteemed international commentators on emerging technologies, both of whom we're fortunate enough to have as guests uh, at our centre at the moment. Um, Jeff Matsura is currently counsel at the Alliance Law Group in the United States. He previously served as director of the programme in law and technology at the University of Dayton Law School in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, before that, he served on an advisory panel to the Virginia Legislature's Joint Committee, Joint Commission, I beg your pardon, on technology and science, addressing issues associated with e-government. He's the author of numerous books and articles dealing with, among other things, intellectual property rights, nanotechnology regulation, and he's the co-author of Law of the Internet, uh, which is published by Aspen Law and Business. Our first speaker, though, is Professor Andy Mia. Andy's Chair of Ethics and Emerging Technologies and Director of the, Create, the Creative Futures Research Centre at the University of the West of Scotland. Although he lives in Liverpool, so I think the definition of West of Scotland has expanded a bit since I left. Um, he's a prolific cultural commentator and philosopher. He's published over 100 solo-authored academic articles in refereed journals, books, e-zines, and national media uh, press, and has written for leading newspapers, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, Le Monde, 
Times Higher Educational Supplement. So without further ado, over to you, Andy. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for being here on such a lovely day in Dunedin. I'd like to find out more about who you are. Um, so my sort of straw polls at the beginning of talks are, how many of you, hands up, if you're on Twitter and consider yourself to be a regular user? Hands up. So that's about three people, or four, out of an audience of maybe 60. That's generous. People that are on Facebook, hands up, regular user. That's about 90% of the audience. And how many of you are bloggers, maybe once a month blogging something at least? Hands up. Two people. Okay, so, so I guess I wonder why you're here. I guess um, my, um, my approach to this topic, I would like to focus down on the, the, what I see as the role of the media. The title for the, for the event is um, WikiLeaks, uh, Guardians of the Public, or Hotbed of Anarchy. And I think my answer, my short answer is, as you would expect an academic to say, both. And um, it seems to me that what's at stake with WikiLeaks is, is, a, is really a, a symbolic transformation of what professional journalism entails. And so what I'd like to do is spend uh, 15 minutes talking about what I see as the kind of key social political issues that, that emerge out of the WikiLeaks context. And it does seem to me that what's, what's important partly is, of course, the issues that they reveal, the, the kind of controversies that underpin the information that they're, that they're presenting and distributing by the media or by themselves but also the legacy of WikiLeaks in the broader context and in terms of what people see as the role of the media in society, because that does seem to me central to what's at stake here. Why is it that we required something like WikiLeaks in order to reveal this kind of content? Is it the case that somehow the traditional media outlets that exist and have existed for many decades are unable to access this kind of content? Are they in a particular position that limits their capacity to find out and discover and indeed release this kind of content. It seems to me that to the extent that, they, that we need something like WikiLeaks, uh, there is clearly a role that goes beyond what traditional media uh, are able to undertake. And, it, and part of that, I think, has to do with the kind of game that, that the media play. And it's very tempting to talk about the notion of the freedom of the press and the idea that there is a free press. And of course, the way in which that's operationalized is quite specific. It has to do with the separation of powers and so on. But, it's, but at the same time, uh, we also have to acknowledge that the media has, has, is engaged within a, a negotiation of knowledge and information. That they don't operate in, uh, independently from politics, that they have certain codes of ethics that may, rightly or wrongly, limit their ability to do the sorts of things that WikiLeaks have been able to do. WikiLeaks has been criticized um, for various reasons, one of which is, is its um, lack of professional codes of ethics. So it's an organization that is, uh, on the one hand, kind of paradigmatic of what new media is all about. It's about the rise of the citizen journalists. It's about the people taking ownership of uh, of, of journalistic information and taking that role upon themselves uh, to undertake uh, some kind of distribution of knowledge. Um, so it, it finds itself amidst an era as, as uh, was kind of symbolized in 2007 um, when uh, Time magazine announced that we were the people of the year. Now, obviously you know that Time magazine has its person of the year every year and, and it's usually someone very well known. Um, in 2007, we were all person of the year. Now, I don't know if you have that on your CVs. Uh, I, I don't. But nevertheless, we were all the, the most important people that year. And that's partly because we, we were collectively creating knowledge and information by blogging, by uh, tweeting a little bit by then, uh, but certainly developing the content that is becoming constitutive of what journalism entails. And that's interesting for all sorts of reasons. One reason is I think it puts journalism in a very... Uh, difficult position, and, and no more was this, was this uh, made evident than in the context of WikiLeaks, where I think uh, we can talk about sort of two phases, really. The, the moment where WikiLeaks decided to set itself up and become this wiki-based environment, whereby people would be able to contribute and submit documents that they felt uh, required the attention of the public, uh, and it was a very ground, uh, bottom-up kind of initiative. Uh, very much like Wikipedia, where you would contribute uh, information to particular articles and that would be discussed and then uh, you'd have a, a, a somewhat final version. Uh, but then it evolved into a much more editorialized kind of uh, entity 
Uh, the stakes were up significantly by the kind of content that they were uh, receiving. And there and they, there and you have the emergence of a, a genuinely new media uh, journalistic outlet who saw its role as being that uh, the entity that filled the gap between journalism and the public. The idea that this is not something that uh, the journalism proper is, is being able to undertake. And of course that allows you especially at that moment where everybody is very keen on the idea that we can take ownership of this information and we can interpret it. We don't need intermediaries to, to explain to us what's going on. The bare facts is simply what we want. They traded on this very notion. At the heart of what WikiLeaks tries to do and continues to, to do, I think, is, is claim that information should be readily available and completely transparent as soon as we have it. And that's a very uh, interesting proposition, uh, one that is appealing, the idea that, that the truth is out there, that this is something that we should all have access to, that, that the foundation of, of good societies relies on the idea that we all have access to information that matters to us, that may have an impact on us. But it does uh, occupy a central uh, tension in, in how we regard certain freedoms within our society. Do we believe that information should be available at the moment of discovery, or do we believe that there is some need for filtering, for um, patience, or indeed some form of interpretation from certain kinds of organizations? Now, I was in an event in December, this was a, this was a, a journalism conference at Microsoft in, in London, and the journalists that were uh, working with The Guardian and, and talked about their experience of working with WikiLeaks um, were reflecting on, on how they saw their job in the context of this kind of entity, whether it's changed at all. And uh, if any of you are budding journalists, uh, they were asked the question whether, in fact, journalists need to have new skills in order to do their work in the future. And uh, the short answer was, no, they don't. All you need to do in order to be a good journalist in the future is learn how to read Excel tables. And it's kind of interesting to to reach that kind of that sort of conclusion because it does seem to place the onus of upon journalists as being that of interpretation of being able to digest data sources uh, as opposed to perhaps going out and and investigating stories themselves so i think there is a willful recognition that journalism partly as, as a result of wikileaks but partly because wikileaks represents this broader transformation in how knowledge production takes place is about trying to, instead of uh, go to your sources, create communities of knowledge. And I think that's what uh, organizations like WikiLeaks and indeed the, the other entities that are out there like Wikipedia are trying to do. Um, it, it's growing knowledge through a community as opposed to relying on specific sources. Now, the parts where WikiLeaks become particularly controversial is in the way in which they undertake their work. And, and you will be aware, of course, that WikiLeaks while still existing and still um, professing to have a backlog of, of content that it has yet to digest, has already kind of splintered out, uh, splintered off into some into different organizations. You'll be aware that the, the former deputy director has, has left the organization and set up the organization OpenLeaks, which in comparison to WikiLeaks claims that it, it, will, it will not publish content, it will not publish documents, instead it will provide that information to um, other sources who may choose to release it. And it appeals to the idea that, in fact, uh, WikiLeaks is not as transparent as it needs to be uh, in order to fulfill it, its, um, its democratic mission. So this goes back to the claim that I was making earlier, that, that WikiLeaks isn't playing the long game, as opposed to the traditional media outlets that exist that are trying to do this, that are involved with relationships with politicians, with their sources uh, of information. And that allows, I think, an organization like WikiLeaks a considerable number of opportunities, but it's a high-risk organization. It's, a, it's an organization that could, that could uh, collapse quite quickly because of the risks that it takes. But it does seem to me that it's an essential uh, part of, of what journalism requires today. And, uh, and, and so the, um, the tension, I think, is a happy one. The reaction of, of journalists, I think Jeff will talk about this in the US context, uh, but I'll talk a bit about it a bit in the UK, because of course we know that the WikiLeaks uh, organization has built relationships with journalism in order to get the information out. In, in fact, it, of course it needs it, it relies on this uh, in order to, to have the maximum impact. 
Journalists in the UK, I think, have been also critical of, of WikiLeaks because uh, the kinds of codes of ethics that journalists uh, accept and, and, and go into when they go through the training um, is not something that underpins what WikiLeaks tries to do. So there have been criticisms that the sources that have informed the, the content that WikiLeaks have distributed haven't been adequately protected, and that this is a, a weakness in the, in the system of, of WikiLeaks that it, that it currently uh, has. And again, I think that OpenLeaks tries to do this more effectively. But it begs the question, at least to me, as to whether there is a need for a code of ethics that should underpin journalism, or whether that era has, I think, quite rapidly coming to an end. Um, and, and again, the broader context here is the way in which information is spread through things like blogs, through things like Twitter, uh, which have become mechanisms, I would say primary mechanisms of information. So it seems to me that WikiLeaks, uh, the legacy of it, is in articulating the way in which information, knowledge, and truth are being renegotiated in a Web 2.0 era. It's not the case now that we require the journalist as much as we used to, at least the professional journalist. But of course, this, this works both ways. The journalism, the journalist, professional journalist, is also changing their practices in terms of how they access content, how they source stories, how they create uh, communities around their work. It's, um, it was only, I think, towards the middle of last year that the New York Times uh, had a, a larger number of subscriptions to its Twitter account than its printed uh, press out. So I th it seems to me that there is this transition taking place. And people are skeptical of this. I think that the, sort of tip, the common reaction is that we nevertheless still need the media to contextualize, to interpret, uh, and maybe just to be a space that we can go to. Certainly having been here in, the, in uh, New Zealand for uh, a week and a half now, I still go back to the BBC website to see what's happening back home. Uh, even though my primary source of news is still is, is Twitter, I still have that uh, organization in the background. So although I think WikiLeaks does change what journalism entails, although I think it changes the, the, our expectations of journalism, uh, I think still it, it, through its appropriation of new media, I think is also part of, of, of the WikiLeaks context today. It's something that um, uh, professional journalists are still intimately connected with. But I just... I'd like to sort of wrap up by, by talking also about time and information. When is it appropriate to find out the truth? And for all of us, I mean, uh, the, the theory that I think WikiLeaks espouses is that we should make things available at the point of discovery. As soon as we know them, they should be made available to people. So if it was known, as, as, it, as, as they claim and as we know, that this uh, Apache helicopter mission uh, gave rise to fatalities in the civilian population, then that ought to have been made clear to the public at the time. But it is a very difficult thing, I think, to go down that route. Um, do we believe that information should always be available at the moment of discovery, or is it something that we think should, uh, in fact, be made clear to us at the point of having been lied to? So I think that the, the, what w perhaps WikiLeaks' most important contribution uh, as a whistleblowing organization, as it defines itself, um, is to have the kind of information that allows it to call out uh, authorities at the moment of deceiving the public. That seems to be an appropriate moment to expose uh, the absence of truth in, in how information is being communicated. The idea that we would prefer a situation whereby, let's say, for example, there was a live public feed of that camera that was in the helicopter that everybody could access uh, and see what was going on does seem to be a step too far. Because I think the, and, and, and the argument for this is that if everyone had information to this sort of content, then clearly the sorts of things that governments try to do would not be possible. If there was a public feed to the Apache helicopters, everyone would know where they are, everyone would be able to see what was going on, the mission would be jeopardized. And this is the argument that is, that of course the US government is, is making in, 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 in the broadest sense in response to WikiLeaks, that jeopardizes uh, national security. That by jeopardizing these kinds of missions, by jeopardizing the public opinion about the value of them, that we are compromising the, the government interest and the na national interests. But if you are providing information at the point of discovery, if you are opening up completely to transparency, there is no society that we can look to in order to know for certain that that would be a better society. I think we can 
develop a very interesting thought experiment as to whether that would be the case. And I think it's incredibly appealing to argue that it would be preferable to have all the information all of the time. But it does seem to me that nevertheless we rely on systems of interpretation. And the question, the key question to me is, what should be the nature of those systems of interpretation? Should it be politicians? Should it be journalists? Should it be members of the public? Um, seems to me that, that it, it, it's, uh, the balance is swaying towards members of the public, towards the idea that the role of the media, uh, as intelligent and helpful as it is, is in sending us the facts and allowing the communities to debate them and come to the conclusions about the importance of, of the information. So we are becoming a much more uh, user-generated community where we're quite happy uh, for organizations like WikiLeaks to do their work in order to get the content to us as soon as possible. And ideally, of course, make more accountable those powers that be that would perhaps wish to distort the truth in order to further their own political gains. Thanks very much. Well, while Andy's given you a context for how WikiLeaks is pushing the boundaries of uh, journalism and journalistic ethics, I'll take a few minutes to talk a little bit about how WikiLeaks is also pushing the boundaries of, of law. Um, much of the legal controversy associated with WikiLeaks is coming out of US law, largely because the United States is the jurisdiction that's been the most bent out of shape by this whole um, episode. Um, but I'd like to also make it clear that when I talk about the legal issues, I'm, I'm totally separating uh, Julian Assange's personal legal issues in Sweden out of that not part of the, the WikiLeaks discussion. I'm, I'm focusing on the legal issues that the WikiLeaks disclosures have, have generated. Um, and another point I'd like to make right up front is for all the discussion about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks legal issues, uh, to my way of thinking, the guy who is feeling the full brunt of the law um, on him right now is the guy, the Private um, Manning, who's the guy who actually leaked that first material, the Apache helicopter video and other material, to WikiLeaks. And I'm going to come back to that because I think that's an important, very important issue that um, WikiLeaks and the forums through which this information gets distributed face potential legal liability, push boundaries of law, but at the end of the day, it's the people who provide this information to these forums, these centers, these hubs, who are um, ultimately more on the hook uh, than, than the forum itself. Um, in the United States, I, I get the sense that part of the, um, part of the reason for the drama is that um, the law enforcement authorities and government actually realize that they've got a pretty weak case. Um, basically, in the United States, they're, they're trying to figure out what they can do to show their displeasure against WikiLeaks. And what they're finding is that their, their arsenal isn't, isn't very diverse. Um, they have an opportunity to try to make some kind of claim of espionage, which, as you might imagine, is really, really tough. And it's really, really tough for a reason. Um, the, the big hurdle in an espionage prosecution, at least in the United States, is it's not enough to show that this stuff was secret. It's not enough to show that this stuff, this secret stuff, when it was disclosed, causes us a problem. You have to get over an intent uh, hurdle, and that intent is basically an intent to, to aid and abet enemies of the United States. Okay, So it's not enough that this stuff is secret and you leaked it. It's not enough that it caused us embarrassment or harm as a nation. You got to show you did it because you wanted to help an enemy of the United States. Tough, very tough in this situation. And part of the reason, I think, for frustration by uh, US law enforcement authorities and um, uh, legislators is that they, they realize that 
the main legal basis for prosecution that they would have um, is going to be very tough to, to succeed on. Um, it, it's, it's the same claim that is, going to, is being raised against Private Manning as well. Um, and he's got a whole lot more at stake um, because espionage in the United States is potentially a capital offense. Um, so there's the espionage claim or prosecution, which I think is, is a tough one against WikiLeaks. And beyond that, you're really kind of stuck in terms of, um, you know, you're a prosecutor and you're very mad, or you're a congressman and you're very mad, but what do you actually, what kind of legal basis do you have for bringing any kind of action, uh, successful action against WikiLeaks or Julian Assange? Um, this is why you start, you start to get debates, hearings um, in the United States Congress about, well, this shouldn't be allowable. And it's that kind of analysis that I think is, is, is troubling to me. Uh, there's, there are reasons why you're having trouble bringing a prosecution under the law. And the reasons are primarily that, that this kind of conduct for, for as embarrassing as it may be, for as disruptive as it may be, uh, was not the kind of conduct that uh, in the United States' development was viewed necessarily to be a bad thing. The notion of disclosing information, the notion of providing access to information to, um, to the public has traditionally been something that the United States has valued. Um, so one of the reasons why the authorities in the U.S. are having a difficult time trying to figure out how to prosecute is that, frankly, it's the kind of conduct that the United States has always been uh, cautious and concerned about trying in any way to limit the disclosure of information that has value uh, to the public. So what we're starting to see is kind of secondary legal actions, okay? nothing anywhere near as glamorous or profound as prosecution for espionage, but going maybe quite a bit farther down that, that spectrum of legal regulatory action, we're seeing things like um, executive orders, okay? One that comes to mind that happened about a month ago was, was an executive order that basically came out and, and, and said that if you are a holder of a security clearance in the United States, get, get given by the United States government, and you make use of, if you access um, information that was um, uh, confidential through a system such as WikiLeaks, uh, you could lose your clearance. Okay, the argument being when you got the clearance, you, background check was done, it was determined that you were a law-abiding, trustworthy uh, citizen, therefore you were allowed to work for the Department of State and see sensitive information. Um, the executive change that's happening in the United States is, and this is not legislation, it's not Congress, it's the kind of action that the executive agencies can take on their own, saying instead, okay, but if you hold a security clearance and we can prove that you ever access this kind of material, you can lose that clearance. And then taking it a step further, and by the way, if we can find, demonstrate that you've accessed this kind of material and you apply in the future for a clearance, that's basis for you not getting it. Okay, so you see the drift. No legislative action, no profound new law, but dramatic efforts to basically pull every lever that's available uh, in the US government's hands to try to discourage this kind of, 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 of conduct. Um, open issue as to whether or not, you know, looking down the road 10 or 15 years, whether you're recruiting for the United States Foreign Service and you only want to have people working for the Foreign Service who've never heard of WikiLeaks or uh, have never been curious about accessing, you know, this kind of information. It's a, um, but that's not the thought process that's going on right now. Right now what's happening is a, a, a review and a basic conclusion that we don't have um, any real legal basis in the United States to get the kind of result that political authorities want. So we're, we're reaching right now. We're, we're kind of grasping for, grasping for straws. Um, 
the whole WikiLeaks debate has also triggered a reopened, uh, re-energized a set of debates that have been happening in the United States for some time with respect to a set of laws that uh, we call shield laws, right? The laws that uh, protect journalists, right, when they refuse to disclose sources. Okay, so this is not the ethical component. This is now a legal component. Uh, many jurisdictions in the United States ha have enacted laws that basically protect, uh, allow uh, journalists to protect the uh, anonymity of their sources. And you can see how that feeds back into the ability of, of journalists to do their job, the need to be able to, to assure their sources that they, that they will remain um, anonymous. Um, there's a, you know, just as Andy had talked about that, blurring of what is journalism, what should journalist, journalism be, who are journalists, right? Um, one of the complications with respect to those shield laws in the United States has been the question of who is a journalist and therefore who is eligible for protection under those laws. Um, WikiLeaks has complicated that whole set of analysis in the United States. The question of to the extent that there are legal protections uh, afforded to journalists, who is eligible, who ought to be eligible for them in a world uh, of WikiLeaks and, and its uh, similar uh, sites and operations that in effect potentially expand the, 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 the scope of and the range of, of journalists. And, the, and the, I guess the last legal piece uh, I'll, I'll just touch on because I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for questions is this question of um, broader law, basically laws, jurisdictions trying to craft legal frameworks so that they are actually attractive, that, the, that their country or their state their jurisdiction is attractive as a place for news organizations, uh, media organizations, whatever, to, to locate. Now, the, the fact that WikiLeaks operated substantially out of Sweden um, was not by chance, right? Um, uh, WikiLeaks was very savvy about what we call forum shopping, basically looking to locate in a jurisdiction where you would have a legal framework that would be as, as uh, strong as possible from your perspective to, to protect what you're doing. And so given what WikiLeaks was doing, they were looking for a jurisdiction where the local laws basically allowed them to, were, were favorable from their perspective with respect to things like protecting sources for journalists, for um, uh, uh, being more lenient on disclosure of proprietary information, all that sort of stuff. And after checking it out, Sweden uh, rated out quite high on that comparison. Um, and that's why WikiLeaks, much of the WikiLeaks operation was in Sweden. Um, other countries are interested in, in maybe challenging Sweden on that front and therefore potentially attracting uh, journalists, media, uh, online uh, service, uh, service providers. Um, and one of the most active, uh, to my knowledge, is, is Iceland. Um, Iceland, after having had their economy essentially devastated by financial collapse, was looking around for something, some other kind of clean, modern, um, a set of uh, uh, industries that they could attract and, and the information uh, content industries and, and service providers were up high on the list. So Iceland is in the process of creating what it's generally considered to be uh, one of the most um, uh, media, journalistic friendly legal environments in the world in the hopes of becoming essentially an information hub. And I'm going to stop there and just go to questions but we'll um, when I think about that, this jockeying among jurisdictions to basically try to become, um, in effect, the, the digital age industrial centers, um, it, it reminds you of, 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 of some science fiction back in you know, the 70s and 80s where there was this notion that there would be data hubs and, and, um, and that information would be the, the currency most highly prized uh, by people, companies, and governments around the world. And um, the WikiLeaks experience suggests that um, perhaps we're getting closer to that, um, to that state of affairs now. Okay.
Well, I don't know what it says about our respective countries that the emerging technologies guy from the USA has an iPad, the emerging technologies guy from the UK has a laptop, and the emerging technologies guy from New Zealand has an Ophimax loose leaf A4 <laughs> pad. But it surely does say something quite positive about New Zealand that we've managed to attract such a, a healthy audience for a thoroughly extracurricular talk tonight. And I think it also says something positive that we've managed to attract such high caliber provocative and incisive commentators. So if you join me once more in thanking Andy and Jeff.